In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to The Deal Board. It's It's been a little while since we've had a normal show. We, we went through a series of live webinars, and then we did our How to Buy a Business series. But now we're back with our regularly uh, weekly episodes, and we've got a, a pretty relevant topic that we have a lot of questions about from sellers. Right, Andy? Yeah, and, and it is still a seller's market and there's still a lot of money out there and a lot of it is is with private equity and there's a lot of different private equity groups and we're going to talk to uh, two people that are very well versed in the industry and are going to tell you basically what they're looking for Uh, and you're right uh, you know listen I've gotten some really great feedback from everybody out there Uh, about these episodes and about the podcast in general. We really appreciate your listenership. So... Yeah, yeah, it's. It, I've, I've heard lots of comments. It's been helpful, especially through COVID when you're planning on selling. But one of the top questions we get from sellers is, you know, what is it like to sell to private equity, and what is private equity looking for? How do I attract a private equity buyer? And really, the goal of putting together the show was to answer those questions for you. And we do. We have two great um, speakers. I have Rob Mossman from Spur Acquisitions out here in Colorado. They have a little bit of a different sw- spin from a typical private equity firm. And I think what you'll see from these two interviews and also when you start talking to private equity buyers in general, everyone's a little bit different. Um, So Rob talks a little bit about his spin. Um, They have a little bit more hands-on management approach than some other groups. And then Andy, you talked to Kyle Madden, right? I did speak with Kyle and Kyle Madden uh, from KLH Capital uh, here in Florida. He's been a longtime supporter of Transworld and of the intermediary industry, uh, being a part of our organizations, the M&A source. Uh, he does a great job. Uh, he has been with big private equity groups, and he's been with smaller private equity groups. And he's with a, I mean, KLH is still a big, a big firm. But, you know, a lot of these guys eventually get out of that, those huge companies and wind up in these smaller companies because they can be more agile and they don't have to like subscribe to the recipe and you're going to hear about the recipe and you're going to hear that not all private equity is alike. And that's what we really wanted to get across today. Yeah. And these smaller groups, and it's, it's great to have Rob and Kyle on because they're usually a better fit for our, our demographic, like the entrepreneurial mindset, the small business owners. So the, these are the, like really two good people to listen to about how private equity could work for a small business owner um, and not typical bus- big business. But, you know, we'll, we'll do too long of an intro because we've got some great long interviews, but we do have some great episodes coming up. I do want to emphasize we're still going getting lots of questions of like, can you still sell a business in this environment? And we're continuing to sell businesses. The market is very active. Um, You know, we probably have a bigger spike in buyer inquiries than I've ever seen in my career and deals are still getting done. It's been reported that there's more buyers than ever, which is fascinating to me. And And it seems counterproductive, but you would think about it if people are losing their jobs and looking to replace income, and there was a ton of money on the sidelines before this all started, uh, it, that all adds up to more activity. Yeah. So, and private equity is no different. There's still a ton of money they're looking to deploy, lots of deals they're chasing. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. Yeah, let's get at it. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And we are talking about private equity. And I have a dear friend, longtime associate, volunteer at the M&A Source and IBBA. So he's uh, he's good about supporting the industry as well. Uh, Kyle Madden from KLH, 
from KLH Capital. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Yeah. So, you know, this is a podcast and we're, you know, usually talking to buyers and sellers. And, you know, there, there's so much activity out there in the world uh, by by private equity, and it's gotten more prevalent, I think, over the years. So tell us a little bit, you know, about what you do at KLH. KLH I'll get that right at one point. And how does private equity work for the most part? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, you're exactly right, Andy, in, in terms of the, the number uh, of private equity shops uh, blooming and, and, and getting into business over the last 10 years. It's, it's, um, it, it's almost like selecting a wealth advisor, right? If, if you're, if you're an owner of a, of a, you know, medium or, or small to medium sized business, there's a, there's a lot of different options. There's a lot of different flavors and colors and types and practices and focuses, et cetera. But, um, by and large, the, the, the answer is that to pick somebody that you're comfortable with. Um, and, and Andy, candidly, your firm uh, can, can help you as the owner select them. But how does, how does private equity work? Um, from, from 100,000 feet, what private equity is doing is raising capital from uh, a, a number of different types of capital sources. It can be from college endowments uh, to mutual funds to pension plans to insurance company dollars to – uh, what's called a family office, uh, which will be a, uh, let's say a, a family uh, has created tremendous wealth, uh, wealth. They will employ actually an office of people to go deploy their their family's wealth into a, a private equity fund. Um, so so think of that as, as your capital base. Um, at KLH, we manage money for a, a handful of, of more institutional investors as well as wealthy families all over the, frankly, all over the world, prominently mm. the U.S., but a a couple different international families, and what what we use these dollars to do is is really work alongside and partner up with business owners and their management teams and their family members to accomplish something. And um, again, at, at 100,000 feet, that is what we do. What I mean by that when I say accomplish something is there's a need for liquidity on one hand. That could be retirement. That could be growth focused dollars. That could be a shareholder buyout. That could be uh, a partner buyout. That could be a, a shareholder saying, hey, I own, let's say, 100% of this business. I would like to take money out of my business and sell half of my company, right? But I, but I may still want to run the business on a day-to-day -day basis, and I still want to own the remaining half of the business, right? Something like that. So there's a, there's a need for capital or liquidity. Uh, for a buyout or a, for, for typically a succession-focused reason or issue. And then on the other hand, uh, typically they're trying to accomplish something, whether that's double the size of the business before they go to retire or they want to cut in members of management that are, that are not currently an owner who would want to be an owner, but they may not have the dollars or resources to buy in at the same terms and conditions that the owner would require. Um, or they need a little fixing up in the business. And that's, that's not to say that the business is in a, in a, in a troubled position, but um, there's a lot of things that we as an equity group in the whole industry will bring to a company um, that is just not the skill set of the entrepreneur, and that's okay. So whether it's how do you build a world-class sales team, right, and break through the glass ceiling that you've had at $20 million of revenue for the last five years or so, or how, how do we go about implementing a new ERP system? We've tried it before. We botched it. It's a pain in the rear end. How do I get it right? Um, and how do I know what's the right uh, uh, product or type of product for me? Or uh, you're at the point where you need a better dashboard to make decisions off of, so therefore you need a CFO or you need a COO or you need a new head of sales or you need some new athlete on your bench uh, to continue building out the business. So n note what I'm not saying. I'm not saying is, you know, let's, uh, let's exchange employees. That's not the game that we play. It's much more of what's the company that you're falling asleep to at night versus the company that you're walking into every day. And what do you need to build that? Is it more money? Is it more people? Is it more technology? Um, and then ultimately we, we bring all three of those things to bear. 
Um, so those are your, your, your two typical things that drive a deal uh, to come to us. And then um, in, in terms of uh, returns, um, it's, it's vastly different from group to group, Andy. But I'd, I'd say typically when you look at the industry, um, IRRs are tricky, right? Because it, it doesn't include time. Sure. Um, because we, we don't candidly know how long we're going to be invested into a company. It could be three or four years or it could be seven or eight years. Um, but our, our typical goal is let's put a dollar into a company and, and take $3 out of the company when we all collectively go to exit. So if you can make three times your money, um, I, I think industry-wide, we all say we're doing our job. Right. Um, so that's, that's, you know, <laughs> crash course in private equity, but a uh, little bit about the funding, a little bit about what we do in terms of our day job, in terms of working alongside these businesses to, to work on their business as the management teams and the owners continue to work in their business. Um, perhaps you want to know about an exit from a, from an exit perspective, there's typically three ways we go to exit the investment, um, one of which is we can exit, and, and I should preface by saying the exit, which may sound like a sensitive topic, uh, by and large needs to be discussed sooner rather than later so that all parties are on the same page and kind of rowing at the same speed and in the same direction. Uh, but typically the options are uh, we could sell up market to a, a larger version of ourselves, uh, right? Take a business that's doing 10 million of revenue. We do a couple acquisitions. We enter a couple new markets. We hire a world-class sales team. That may double or even triple the size of the business. Well, when when the management team calls us and says, "Hey, you know, I, I'd like to know what my 30% of the company is worth. Let's let's exit. We we too would like a liquidity event." We may look up market to a larger private equity group to, to buy the collective business or the shares of the business. Um, second option is we could go to a strategic buyer, which is somebody who's already in the space. That may be a competitor or that may be a company that is also backed by another private equity group, but doing the same sorts of services or selling the same types of products that we are. Thirdly, uh, and we've done this a couple of times where we've sold the business to its management team or to the next generation of family, right? So bought the business from mom and dad, um, allowed them to retire and, and put in place their succession plan, worked alongside the next generation of the family to, to grow the business and to keep that legacy in place. And then ultimately sold our ownership to that next generation of family. So, you're typically going to see one of those three routes taken for the exit. Um, and again, time frame is, is wildly different from group to group. Um, I think that's where, where private equity needs to more listen than, than tell. Um, uh, you know, you can do a fine job of, of evaluating your private equity par partner by asking what does the exit look like? Well, I, listen, you, you made a ton of great points there. And I think one of the ones was originally, uh, like when you're picking an investment advisor, this is a big decision for business owners. This is, and, yep. and the reason why we like you so much and we've been partners with you is because you're so flexible as you were just talking about all the different ways that not only can you partner with the business owner, but then exit with the business owner as well and and doing listening instead of telling and there yeah. is a huge and you, you you also picked up on the point and i'll let you expand a little bit that there are different private equity groups out there and not all of them are going to fit the, the 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 deal itself you really have to be careful because you, you know there there is a hunting with an elephant gun per se there's there's private equity that may be too big for the businesses. Um, there might be, they're just not the right fit. So, you know, how do you, how do you work with the owner to decide if you're a good fit? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> sticking true to that analogy of, of the wealth advisor. I mean, the, as you guys as business owners know, the one thing you've got to do here is you've got to get it right. And, and candidly, that's the same goal and objective that, that we have at our firm and that any investor should have is they've got to get it right. And, and that's not 
us sitting here saying we're the smart guys in the room we have to get it right because that's what we do it's us acknowledging reality right reality right. isn't always perfect right you can lose customers you can lose key sales guys you can lose key employees of yourselves for for nothing private equity driven it's, it's just life so what i mean when i say we, we both need to get it right is the structure the valuation the things that matter in our li- literally in our lives that matter right because that drives how we each make decisions um if somebody's bottom line focused versus somebody else's culture focused, that may mean two different decision making is, is being right. applied. Doesn't mean one is right or wrong, they're just different. So um, in terms of doing your your upfront diligence on figuring out, you know, who's the right partner and why, um, it it sounds soft here, Andy, but a, as you know, a lot of this is playing kind of sort of the dating game. Yeah. Um, meeting a handful of them, figuring out, hey, you know, who shows up in a pair of jeans versus a pair of khakis versus a suit and tie? And what do we think of all three of those? You know, what feels good? What feels bad? What feels professional? What feels a little overdone? Um, what are you looking for? Are you looking for somebody who says, hey, I've got a stable of operating partners who can come in and, and help grow your business? Is that is that exactly what you're looking for? Or is that fundamentally the opposite of what you're looking for? Right? A, a lot of guys... Uh, that we work with say, hey, I I need to do a deal. I need liquidity to accomplish something. I think I know what I can build my business into, but I don't want a boss, right? I don't want somebody telling me how to do it because nine times out of 10, they're probably wrong because they haven't done it before. Right. Um, but then there's other groups that will say, hey, we have what's called value-added operational partners, which can help you from, from a day-to-day perspective work in the business while the private equity partners work on the business. So point being is there's a, there's a lot of different shapes and sizes, um, good actors, bad actors, et cetera. And by leveraging a, a firm uh, like Andy's, Andy's two goals, one, get the deal done at a fair price and valuation. Two, get the deal done at a fair price and valuation, but with the right people. Yeah, good, um, good deals is for good people. Is equally as important. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, that, that's a saying that you hear around our shop as well is, is, you know, good, fair deals with good, fair people. Um, right. And then from there on, nobody can kind of nobody has the crystal ball. So um, from a structuring perspective, it, it's actually germane to talk about it now because the economy has been so good for so long. Right. Uh, a, a lot of the leverage markets are very much so open for business and there's a lot of private equity dollars that need to be deployed. Um, that, that candidly have a fuse burning behind them. So um, you're seeing groups stretch for value, which mm-hmm. means two things. One, it's a really good time to be a business owner that's contemplating selling or a liquidity event. That's, I sound like a salesman and I don't mean to, but it's, it's a good time to be in that position because you have a lot of options um, and you have a lot of capital that's available to help you get your deal done. Um, but secondly than that, you know, you, you just need to know the, the, the characters and the personalities of, of the folks that you're, uh, that you're contemplating working with. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it is the matchmaking game and it is, you do have to look around and you have to understand what their goals are. And hopefully that aligns as a seller and you have to, you know, hopefully that aligns with what the private equity groups uh, goals are as well. And, you know, it is just deciding what you want in a deal. We, we, that's how we approach a deal. The first thing we ask the sellers is what are you looking for? Like you said, a liquidity event or a partnership or the ability to grow or all the above. So, I mean, that, that was a great, you know, kind of 15 minute, uh, crash course in private equity. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to add that you thought would be, um, you know, talking about what perhaps you know, business owners, what you're looking for in a business when, when you're looking. Yeah, I, I think the, I think one, one thought that's been at the tip of my tongue is, is just for, for the business owner to know that not, not all private equity groups are looking to buy a hundred percent of your business. And, and I would almost say a vast majority of us would not be looking to buy 100% of the business. And what that means is if, if a transaction 
or a liquidity event is not crystal clear to you in terms of exactly what you want to do or exactly what your partner or partners want to do, that's okay. Uh, we do a lot of deals where they end up looking either different or slightly different from how they started. Um, and, and what I mean by that is we work with multiple businesses that have multiple different shareholders where, and I'll make this up, but one wants to retire, one maybe, maybe not wants to retire, it depends, and two or three that absolutely don't want to retire. In fact, they, you know, they may be younger or they may be the same age, but they want to stay on and they want to grow their company. So you have, you have two, if not three, differing goals and objectives. Well, to us as a private equity group, that's great. I mean, candidly, that's a good thing because what we do is listen and say, hey, the folks who want to be bought out and retire, great. We'll stroke a check. We'll buy you out. Awesome. The folks that say, well, you know, we want to figure it out. Maybe we buy half of their ownership or a third of their ownership or two thirds of their ownership. And then the folks who, you know, want to continue growing and running the business. Great. No harm, no foul. Let's partner up with them and leave their equity ownership in place. Um, and a lot of businesses have what we refer to as key lieutenants, right? Longtime employees who are critical to the business, but that may not be an owner today. And that's one of the most fun things that we get to do is have that conversation at the right time and place and methodology, but have that conversation in terms of let's put a deal in place that cuts them into the ownership. So long-winded way of saying, if you know exactly the type and the quantity of liquidity or the liquidity type of deal that you're looking for, terrific. Um, if you don't, that's okay because these deals are highly, highly customizable. Yeah. And, and being flexible and finding someone like Kyle and KLH to do a deal with is, is critical. And that's what we can help you do at Transworld. I appreciate you giving me a plug. Uh, Kyle, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you though and talk more, uh, how best to do that? Uh, my, my my short answer is call my buddy Andy. Yeah, and well, Andy can I, I, I do appreciate work with you, that. Work with you first, and and uh, and get your get your stuff in order. Um, get your file in order. What I mean by that is 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 just your your financial house in order. But in all honesty, I'm I'm um, I'm based in Tampa, Florida. The firm's KLH Capital. Uh, my email uh, is on our website, but it's it's Kyle at klhcapital.com. But um, uh, you don't need to call me first. Working uh, working with Transworld is a is a very fine shop, and and we think highly of you guys. Yeah, and I, I think we add value to the whole process as well, making it easier for. I mean, how many deals do you look at a year, Kyle? Uh, it's a, it's a daunting number, Andy. It's it, at this point, it's probably about two thousand opportunities per year, and that's that's everything. That's that's stuff way up market and way down market. Yeah. Um, and that funnel is quite wide. So it, it, it's 2000, uh, boils down to about three or four. Uh, unfortunately, I wish we could close more than that, but I, I think the reality is, is just, there's, there's a lot of companies out there. Uh, we focus in industrial services, distribution and manufacturing. So when I see something in healthcare, um, I'm the first to admit, Hey, I'm, I'm not the right partner. So, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity around there, but it's it's about you know managing your time and and where you can best add value and help the person. And that's where we come in. We could help uh, people make sure that they have it packaged correctly and make sure that they have their goals set before they even talk to, to Kyle because he's busy. He's looking at two thousand deals, which is incredible. Kyle, thank I know, you. It's crazy. I know it is. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Hey, Andy. Do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Everybody, we're back, and it is deal of the week, and we have a very special guest, uh, my partner, Peter Berg. Peter, welcome. And this is an interesting deal because this is like 100% COVID, right? It, was, it started right after COVID hit, and then uh, you closed the deal. So why don't you talk a little bit about it? Sure, Andy. Thank you. Um, good to be back on the podcast. Yeah, it was it was an interesting deal because it was a referral from a uh, from a CPA who's referred clients to me in the past, and it happened uh, around the middle of March when we had our office was closed and we were already working from home. I never met the seller, 
uh, had some Zoom calls and, and, and a couple of phone calls, signed the marketing agreement, uh, pa- packaged it up and went to market, started to get, now we're in, say, in April, started to get a lot of interest. The, the company itself was a logistics company, a third-party logistics company, where if you're, if you're a seller of products online, instead of having your own warehouse and your own crew, you you deliver your goods to a, this third-party warehouse, and when orders come in, they pick them, they pack them, they ship them, and, and take care of it, and you pay per piece. So I got a lot of demand. No, uh, probably spoke to you know 20 different buyers, all on Zoom or phone. Got three offers, selected the best offer, entered diligence. Again, never met the seller, never met the buyer, never saw the business. Everything was done from my home office. And went through the whole process. Finally, at the end of due diligence now, let's say in the end of May, the seller wanted to come into town from out of town and see the facility. So I did make arrangements for him to see the facility. Seller was out of town, had an employee take us around, but I did actually meet the buyer and see the business for the first time at the end of due diligence. Mm. That's great. And so obviously the, you know, the deal, it was a good deal. Again, as we say, good deals for good people. So why don't you talk about the particulars a little bit, you know, how much did the buyer pay? Well, well, so the buyer, the business was listed for 600,000. The buyer paid 580,000 with a hundred thousand dollar seller note for one year. So three and a half percent interest. And it just accrued interest in principle and it's it's paid in one lump sum at the end of the year. Primarily the reason for that was just to have a cushion so that um, if there was any, you know, there's a lot of shipping costs incurred. The, the shipping expenses run about 150000 a month in this business. So the buyer just wanted some comfort to know that if FedEx came back in and said, hey, you owe me 50000 uh, that there was going to be at least a pot of money there to, to protect them. What was interesting is that we were supposed to close at the end of June. We were at having the closing again, all online, DocuSign, uh, eNotary. Nobody was in the same town. Everybody was in different towns. The morning of the closing, my seller calls me says, you need to get the buyer on the line right away. I said, what's up? He said, well, just get him on the line and we'll talk. I set up the call. Turns out one of the employees had had tested positive for COVID-19 that morning. Mm. Literally, the closing documents had been distributed by DocuSign. So all people were in the process of clicking. And... The seller, uh, so they, there were five other employees who were, who worked with that employee. So they were all sent home. They all went to get tested and they all had to work from home until the test results. The buyer said, let's find out what happens with the test results before we close. So we postponed the closing. Sure enough, three of the five also tested positive. Right. They had a total of four employees. Now this is out of 15 total employees. So four out of 15, is, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty disruptive. They were able to keep the business open, but we postponed the closing for a month. Mm. So we postponed it until the end of, Ju- of July, just until last, last week. And um, the, the employees were asymptomatic, but they were, they were uh, still positive. So um, two weeks later, the employees came back to work. Everybody was back to work and we closed. Great. So, so all is well that ends well, but you know, that's what's happening now. That's why, you know, you need guidance through this tough time. I mean, it is really hard uh, to sell a business, keep everybody in. And again, we could do things obviously virtually and help you get the best buyer. Obviously we create a competition for the deal. So that was good. We, 
we created a lot of competition and we had three offers and they were all pretty close to the asking price and they were all pretty close to the asking price in cash. Um, the, the, the seller owned the real estate in this particular transaction. Right. And it was a large piece of real estate, close to 40,000 square feet that had a high monthly rent. So the, seller really was evaluating the buyers for their credit worthiness as tenants. Mm -hmm. In essence, you know, selling the business was one thing, but having a tenant for the next 10 years paying rent was more important Right. in this case. So we actually went with the buyer who had the strongest financial statement and the most experience that looked like they would, they would be successful as as an owner of the business. Well, as we say, the best buyer is not always the best price. It's the person who's going to close and the person who's going to keep the business going, right? Absolutely. And that's the case. And everyone was happy. There you go. Sounds like a good deal for good people again. Great. So, uh, Peter, if someone wants to get in touch with you to get do some more deals, what's the best way? Best way is email me at pberg at transworldma.com. Or always, you can call me on my cell at any time, 954-907-3007. All right. Sounds like a good deal. Thanks, Peter. All right. Thank you, Andy. Bye. Welcome back, everybody. And today, as you know, we're talking about bigger deals. So we're talking about deals that usually have, you know, say, a million or more in EBITDA and how to attract that private equity buyer that we all talk about or a private equity backed buyer. And I'm very excited to have a special guest join us today, Rob Mossman, who is an operating partner at Spur Acquisitions here in Colorado. And he has been involved in a number of private, private equity backed deals and is also currently searching for a deal. So Rob's going to talk to us a little bit today and open our eyes about what buyers like him are looking for in the market. But first, Rob, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so my name is Rob Mossman. I'm looking to buy a business here in Colorado. I have a little bit of a unique background in that I've been an entrepreneur myself. I've started three of my own companies. Uh, I can tell you the first two didn't quite do what I had hoped they they should do, but the third one uh, grew dramatically and did a couple million dollars of revenue in the first year and 16 million in revenue in the second year. And I learned a really valuable lesson about working capital and ended up selling that business mm -hmm. to my factory. Uh, I since have, um, have run two different private equity backed businesses as CEO. Most recently it was a uh, IOT or connected network device company and a SaaS deployed software uh, and we sold that to a $2 billion parent in July of 2018. Uh, after a year off, uh, some travel, kayaking with my wife, um, I promised her that I'd actually go back to work. And so I realized mm -hmm. that I didn't want to join a portfolio company of a private equity group and be embroiled in a turnaround project. Because when private equity changes CEOs, there's something not going right. And so a hired CEO will have a lot of turnaround work. And instead, I wanted to find a good company that was making a found, making the founder of the company, the current CEO, really good living, but had the ability to bust through to that next plateau. So I brought together investors. We now are looking to acquire a company to give liquidity to that founder. And then I would move in as CEO and help lead the day-to-day -day for that company to move to the next the next level. And this allows me to focus on growth and not focus on turnaround. And that's really where my skill is and where my heart is. And so uh, Spur Acquisitions is a private equity group based in, in uh, ha we're based in Denver. Half of our investors are entrepreneurs from the Denver area. The other half of the investors are entrepreneurs from the Boston area. We have another office in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And we are looking for deals in the lower middle market which we define as one to five million in annual EBITDA and businesses that are too big uh, to, be, to be run by a first time CEO and difficult businesses to separate from their founder or current CEO unless you can bring in somebody with experience 
and not quite big enough to be rolled up into a strategic. We define this as the lower middle market. Um, and so we're currently looking for deals. There's three operating partners uh, in Spur right now. I'm located in the Denver Boulder area. There's one in the San Francisco area and one in the Boston, uh, Southern New Hampshire area. Yeah. Well, I love your story in the background of, you know, previous entrepreneurial experience. I also love how you describe yourself as that you thrive in the chaos of growth, right? Because that's where a lot of these companies are, right? And that's a, a big hallmark of, you know, what type of companies are ready for private, equi private equity back buyers. And it, it's that uh, amount of growth, that quick growth that's happening. And like you touched, touched upon working capital. But as we were talking previously, we really identified four areas that make um, a difference in attracting a private equity buyer versus like what we call an individual buyer, a first time CEO. And the first one you touched on was size. So let's talk a little bit about that size and why is it important to have that minimum EBITDA of 1 million? Say? So the reason why a minimum EBITDA of a million is important is because it show it, it communicates stability in the business, which then reduces the risk for the buyer looking forward because the business could afford to suffer a, a bit of a dip, excuse me, a downturn in sales or any other fluctuation and not go away. So if the EBITDA is really small, a private equity buyer has, has trouble feeling confident in the forward looking projections of the profit of the business. The second reason why it's important is that when private equity buys businesses of this size, they almost always buy it with a combination of equity and debt, which means that our investors will write equity checks and we will put some debt on the business, meaning a long-term debt obligation for us one to two times EBITDA. So if there is a stable profitable profitability of a million plus, then we're more confident in the business's performance moving forward, number one. And number two, the bank is also confident, confident in the profitability of the business, which then allows us to cash out the seller with a combination of money that came from debt and equity. And the debt is less expensive for us than the equity. So you may have heard the term leverage buyout. It's like this miniature mm -hmm. version of a leverage buyout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it totally makes sense. And I think when you explain that, it, it that's sometimes I, I talk to sellers and they're like, oh, well, they just don't understand the future value, right? And we always talk about that there is future value in the company, but a lot of almost all evaluations are based on past performance. And that was a really good explanation of why, too, if we pull that into evaluation. So kind of dovetailing onto that, you know talking about future projections, what about growth opportunities? How important is growth to you? Because you mentioned that's really your strong suit and what you're specifically looking for. But how important is growth opportunities in these deals? Very important. But before I talk about growth, I want to mm -hmm. dovetail from the size of the EBITDA to the stability mm -hmm. of the EBITDA. So if you're at a million dollars, yeah. if you're at a million dollars in EBITDA, we also want to look at prior year and two years prior. And so it's best if you're at a million, 900, 800, and you show this very stable business that is growing a little bit or, or flat. Because then we can look over a three-year period and really feel confident that the business can continue. If the business has a great 2020 with a million or a million five EBITDA, but 2019 was 250,000 and 2018 was 400,000. Then as a buyer, you start to average the EBITDA over the trailing 36 months and you don't see as valuable a business. So first is the level of your EBITDA and, or profit. And second is the stability of your EBITDA or profit over the trailing 36 months so that the confidence in projecting that forward is greater. Make sense, Jessica? Makes total sense. And, and also, you mentioned this earlier, it's also important for bankers, right? So part of the big um, the big way to get sellers paid cash at the closing table is, is the ability to use debt, 
and that's for any buyer, right? And and banks do the exact same thing. So that stability of, of EBITDA, cash flow, whatever you want to call it on the size deals is really critical. And I think right now in our current environment, we're going through a period of economic turmoil that shows you why why is that so important, right? Of both the level of cash flow coming out of the business, but also the stability. If you're looking at businesses right now that are still stable through this this COVID restrictions and crisis that we've got going on, I, you know it's easier to get debt finance, which ends up cash in the buy, in the seller's pocket. But also, it attracts more buyers. It commands a higher multiple. All that good stuff. I completely agree, and you know the, it, there is a little bit of leeway for understanding fluctuation due to COVID. Right. You may have heard the right. term EBITDA, right? EBITDA with yeah. a C for coronavirus, which helps you look at the business right. prior to this pandemic and give you another lens in it. So you asked about growth opportunities. If we've established right. the size of the EBITDA, if we've established the stability of the EBITDA, then you look at the business and you say, okay, what could happen with that business? What additional markets could they go in? Or so it might be geographic markets. It might be product line expansion. It might be shifting of the business from one-time revenue to recurring revenue. Um, they, where might investments have the biggest return? So if we were to buy the business and then reinvest the EBITDA into sales, for example, what would happen then? So once you establish the size and the stability, you then begin to put together the growth plans about how you would invest in this business. Good businesses always have growth opportunity, and sometimes they're not getting that growth opportunity for reasons not related to the business. So let me paint a hypothetical situation. So we've got a seller that owns a very successful business, and that business is delivering a million to, let's say, two million in EBITDA every year. And they've got a good management team, and it's just kind of running. So now you've got an owner who's making a million or two million bucks a year and the stress level is not super high. It's like, okay, this business is actually a good business and it's making me wealthy. However, that every business doesn't have a linear growth rate. There's always a stair-step growth rate. A business grows and plateaus and then grows and plateaus and grows and plateaus. And when you bust from a plateau through a growth zone, You have to reinvest your EBITDA and you have to work harder to get to the next plateau. So now you've got an owner who's making a million or two million a year who says, wow, this business might be five or 10 million in revenue and it could be 20 or 30 million in revenue. But in order to get there, I have to stop making a million or two million a year. I have to double down and reinvest all this money and then I got to work twice as hard and then we get there. It's like, do I really need to? I've made a ton of money in the last couple of years. Yeah, so right. a lot yeah. of time businesses that are really ripe to sell to private equity are businesses that are comfortably profitable at a particular plateau. And in order to get to the willingness to invest in the next plateau, the founder gets to take some cash off the table, which then makes them more willing to invest to get to the next plateau, the next growth zone with private equity. So growth opportunities are imperative and they always exist. And the fact that they're not being manifested in their current form is not always because the business can't do them. It's because there's other motivations that sometimes you just don't want to do them. Right. I always talk to people and I said, like, you know, when you decide to sell a business, it's, there's part financial motivation, but it's mostly personal, right? Because you, like you, you said, you talked about these plateaus and reinvesting, not just money, but time. And I see this a lot in the baby boomer demographic. So those of you who are, are, are in those baby boomer demographic, like this might speak to you because it's not just about investing money, but it's like, do you want to go back to working 60 or 80 hour weeks to get to that next plateau? And, you know, I hope when I'm in my 60s and I've run a business for 40 plus years, I can sit back and go, you know what? Not not right now. I'm kind of enjoying life. So we see that a lot in the baby boomer demographic. And I know that's, you know, a target market for a lot of private equity firms right now. So um, I, I see that a lot. And if you're listening to the show and you're in that demographic, hopefully that kind of hits home a little bit to you. 
Yeah, yeah. which actually let's, transitions let's, us nicely to yep. this next piece of, well, if you're in that baby boomer demographic and you've run a successful business and it's made you wealthy, now the majority of your net worth is tied up in that business. What has to happen mm-hmm. for you to be able to get liquidity in that most valuable asset that you own and the freedom to enjoy that liquidity? So what has to, what has to happen? And there's yeah. kind of two elements here. The, the first element is the traditional private equity model. The traditional private equity model looks for strength in a management team. So they look for an an executive team that bears the bulk of the load for the operation of the business, which then means that the CEO and founder themselves are not critical to the day-to-day success or failure of the business or less critical. If a traditional private equity can see a management team that carries that strength, then they are willing to invest in and provide liquidity to that seller or that founder and put more responsibility on the executive team and less day-to-day responsibility on the, on the seller or the founder and less of an earnout. So essentially get paid over five years for the value of your business. That's one model. However, in this size business, that's not always easy to do because the businesses are big and complex, but they're not so big that they run autonomously from an executive team. And so the founder, who is often the CEO, is usually critical to the mix. So with Spur acquisition, we provide an alternative to traditional private equity where we bring seasoned, experienced entrepreneurs who can replace the founder as CEO at close which then means that that the executive team doesn't have to be capable of operating without the founder, but a new CEO with experience of handling businesses that size creates the mechanism for freedom for the founder that goes with the liquidity that they're getting. And so this is our unique model of leadership and capital that really is attempting to address the, the weakness of traditional private equity investors not truly giving freedom to the seller. They might give you cash, right. but they might, they might make you answer to some spreadsheet jockey for five years while you run mm-hmm. their business to get your earn out. And so right. the best thing you can do to create freedom for yourself and to create a more attractive entity for private equity is to A, have a leadership team that is strong and carrying the majority of the load, which then gives you more freedom when private equity comes in because they don't have to hire a new CEO. They can promote one from within and taper the seller out. Or B, look to a private equity group that will deliver and bring a new experienced CEO at close, which which is what Spur does. And so- In those environments where you're not big enough to sell to a strategic and you don't quite have the, um, the desire to work on a five-year earnout, answering to a 27-year-old spreadsheet jockey on a business that's already made you wealthy, or you don't quite have the management team to make it happen, this leadership and capital option from Spur is another option that's available to you that many people don't know about. Yeah. Now I like the option too, because having that full management team in place, CEO ready to be promoted within, it's a big hurdle for most, um, most owners. And it's not just necessarily a a money thing, right? It's, it's, did they decide a lot of, a lot of business owners like that control of being the acting CEO and being involved in day to day. So it's more of like a lifestyle choice and how you like to run your business. So I like that this this is a different model um, and good for people to know that this type of model is out there and it's not just t- traditional private equity. And I think one thing I've learned through this conversation, I hope all, all of you as listeners have too, is that grouping private equity all together into like one buyer type is it, just like not the right thing to do because there's a lot of different variations between each different firm. Um, and that can be how they're structured, what they're looking for, and also, you know, what they're going to do with your deal. 
Um, so lots of different options in the environment. I think spur is a great option if um, you are in, are you looking nationally or just within the Denver area? So uh, I personally am looking in the Denver Boulder area. However, we have three mm -hmm. operating partners and the other two are looking nationwide. Um, what we are look the most important things for us are these mm -hmm. things that we talked about is the profitability in the one to 5 million range, which allows us to write checks from 5 million to 50 million. Um, two, is there stability in the core business? And three, is there opportunity to grow the business if we reinvest and bring it, bring it new leadership to help the legacy of this founder actually further for generations to come? Um, and four, is that seller motivated for the freedom and the liquidity that our, that our model brings? Right. This is a great overview. We're going to drop some of this information into the show notes as well. And if you want to learn more about Rob or Spur Acquisitions or think that your company might be a fit for them, um, their web address is spuracquisitions.com. We'll also drop that into the show notes too, so you can reach out directly to them. But Rob, I'd like to thank you for your time, your openness, and your information. I appreciate it. I'm sure all of our listeners do as well. And thanks for being on the show. Well, Jessica, thank you very much. And I'll just leave you with, with something that what these founders have done is really hard to do. Uh, and we have, as entrepreneurs, we have tremendous respect for the business that these sellers have, have built and know that there's opportunity for these businesses to grow, but they should feel proud of what they've done to even be able to be considered a, to start a business and grow it and be able to sell it. And it takes entrepreneurs who have been through that difficult path to be able to truly have the respect for these sellers and, and what they've done. And we all come from the entrepreneurial side and have respect for, for your clients and for people that have this option to see their business go on under new leadership. I totally agree. Thank you so much for that, Rob. And thank you again for being on the show. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Jessica. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Welcome back, everybody. And today we're talking about larger businesses and businesses that would attra attract private equity type buyers. Um, so joining me is Dustin from our Transworld Business Advisors Rocky Mountain office in Denver, Colorado. Dustin's been on the show before. Welcome back. Hi. Always a pleasure. So... You've got a larger size listing that you have available for sale. Why don't you just give us like the high level overview to start? Sure. Yeah. I've got a pool installation company located here in Colorado, which is kind of a bit of a niche. Uh, they've really targeted a higher end clientele and given COVID and people wanting to stay at home, this has been a very good year for them so far. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about the numbers and, you know, obviously pool, co pool company makes sense during COVID, right? But let's talk about the numbers. What, what, uh, what is the business making? What is the seller asking for in terms of a purchase price? Sure. So the business right now is, like I said, is doing very well. They're going to install about 50 pools this year at an average price of 110,000. So, you know, just over $5 million there in total sales with a net uh, profit of about 40,000 per pool. So I'll let you do that math. Mm -hmm. We currently have it listed at 2.2 million and, and change. Uh, and this one's not going to be a bank deal. This is more of a cash and carry situation. Nice. So pretty good sized business attract a, a pretty wide pool of buyers, no pun intended. Right. But who do you think the ideal buyer would be for this business? The ideal buyer for this is a businessman who sees an opportunity here, uh, you know, either private equity or whatnot. It, it has a great staff in place, but it needs somebody that can see the big picture versus just work inside the business. Nice. And last but not least, Dustin, if someone wants to learn more about this business or anything else that you have listed for sale in Colorado, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, best way to get in touch with me is just to shoot me a quick email, Dustin at tworlddenver.com. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming back on the show. We wish you the best of luck with this listing. I'm sure it won't last long and look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. 
If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com. 